after that rather whirlwind talk, tour of places and sites in um, Europe, I mean, I've got a rather more prosaic account of two urban renewal examples from Auckland. But it was wonderful being on um, those tours to see some of the completed or almost completed examples of urban renewal. Because researching um, urban renewal here in New Zealand, you're very mindful of just how long it takes for these developments to come to fruition. And back in um, 2013, with two of our PhD students from um, Resilient Urban Futures, Simon Oppert and um, Eddie Dolan, we identified three medium density developments in Auckland um, that could be case study sites for their PhD research. Um, and we, we purposefully chose um, sites of different scales. Um, one was a small site with 32 dwellings in Avondale. One was, uh, was um, a, four, a 400 dwelling site in Mount Wellington. And the third was Hobsonville um, Point that I'm going to talk about later, which is, uh, will, when completed, will have around 4,000 dwellings. And when we um, selected these sites, Earthworks was, was, had been undertaken, uh, dwellings had been sold off the plans, and it was projected that residents would move into the sites in uh, 2014. Well, that seemed like a good timeline for their, their topics, were, which were around residential choice and community formation. But uh, three years later, um, there have been a number of delays. This is the Avondale site. Uh, residents have recently moved in um, two years after it was, um, they, were, they were supposed to. This is the Mount Wellington site, um, and it remains Earthworks today to three years later after being, going into receivership and being sold twice, and the 140-odd um, households that um, paid deposits on houses there ha had their deposits returned to them at the end of last year, which will make it difficult for them to get back into the rising housing market in Auckland. The third is Hobsonville Point, and houses are going up here at a pace. Um, more than one a day is being completed at, at Hobsonville Point at the moment. But still, the process has been a slow one. The planning has been a slow one because conversations that kick-started this um, between Waitakere City Council and central government, um, they, they started in the late 1990s. And it's still going to be another seven to ten years, depending on the housing market in Auckland, before this is finished. So it's a 25-year uh, project uh, here at Hobsonville um, Point. Um, now, the, the map on the left um, shows you where um, Hobsonville Point is. It's near the um, northern harbour crossing, um, and it's 23 kilometres from the CBD. And that has implications for the... Um, the potential for sustainable transport, because um, it's, it's fairly much on the city fringe um, there. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Hobsonville Point, and then I'm going to um, speak about Tiaramua Future Streets, which is a street intervention study, which is you know another form of urban renewal. So Hobsonville Point has been developed by the Hobsonville Land Company, which is a, is a subsidiary of um, Housing New Zealand. And it was established in 2006, to develop the old Hobsonville Air Base um, site. And the, the idea um, at the time was for a new model of Crown-led urban development um, in New Zealand. And the vision was for more than just houses. It, it was in the tradition of um, sort of you know, urban um, development um, where you're creating an integrated uh, community. And the photographs here are, are, well, actually, the vision's right there, isn't it? To build a strong, vibrant community that sets new benchmarks for a quality and accessible urban development with an environmental response, environmentally responsible focus. And so the development company uh, set up a public-private partnership with an Australian developer, um, and who in turn engaged a number of local um, developers. The whole area was master planned. And what you can see there on the left hand side, these were, those photographs were taken in November 2015. Um, and you can see the houses that were um, developed and occupied in one of the precincts, because it's been, it's been rolled out as a series of precincts. Um, subsequent to the master planning process, and the photograph to the to the right is the Catalina precinct, and so since November, um, houses have gone up and residents have now moved into that um, that area. Uh, 
as of about uh, May, there were about 700 homes that were occupied at Hobsonville Point and about another 360 that were under construction. And of those just over a thousand um, homes that have been um, sold thus far, because most of the homes are now selling off the plans, 27% are what are currently being defined as affordable within this complex. And affordability is being defined as a percentage, it was benchmarked against Auckland's median house prices, and it's currently 550,000 as an affordable um, home at Hobsonville Point. So there have been a number of tensions in this development over time between sustainability and affordability, between um, social and um, commercial goals, and also between inclusion and um, exclusion. So a number of developers have been involved and a number of architects. So this is just to give you an idea of the diversity of dwellings that have been going up at Hobsonville Point. Um, uh, currently, uh, so different sizes, different designs, different typologies. Currently 9% of the dwellings are um, apartments, 57% terraced houses or duplexes, and 34% standard detached houses, but mostly on fairly small um, sites. And there are a range of sizes, although Two to four bedrooms um, is the, the sort of mo most of the houses. Um, as, the, as the project's been developing, the density of the development is increasing, and some of the um, coming neighbourhoods are going to be up to um, about 40 dwellings per hectare, and the drivers of that have been um, the, the high demand for housing in um, Auckland, um, the, um, the, the developers recognising that uh, apartments and terraced houses can be sold. Um, people, there is a market for them. Um, and also it helps the um, land company meet um, develop um, affordability uh, targets because 20% of the um, dwellings in the area are to be um, affordable. And right from the outset, the land company's um, taken a very, um, had a very strong interest in uh, developing um, community and, and placemaking and invested early on in um, a, a cafe on the site and um, the, a, a farmer's market to bring people into the area and to start to create some activity and start to um, have some sense of a growing community um, being in this area. Um, there was also on-site primary and secondary schools built very early on again, so create preparing the sort of infrastructure, the social infrastructure, before residents moved in. And the school started with rather small numbers of um, pupils, but that's building up as the um, number of residents um, are building up. Neighbourhood pocket parks have been central part of the master plan right from the start, as well as um, bigger open green spaces. And that's been to encourage social interaction at that um, neighbourhood level, at the sort of laneways level. Um, and the, the land company has also um, been very in, in, involved in setting up a residence association and running events, both um, small and in association um, with the residence association and, and on their own. And a high quality pedestrian friendly streetscape um, has been integral to the project from the outset and cycleways. So internal to the development, um, walking and cycling um, is, is safe and easy and, and encouraged. But creating a sense of community has also been um, very purposefully um, market-related as well. So it's had dual um, objectives, both um, social and commercial. Um, and you'll see the, a comment that was um, from one of the... Uh, land company representatives a couple of years ago, this comment actually, our board are pretty adamant that the community development stuff that we're doing will result in higher land values. There is commercial sense to it. Um, and um, this is um, new urbanist developments um, you know, around the world often struggle with this one because once you make a very um, nice urban environment and land values go up, um, it tends to become more of an elite middle class um, development. Um, sustainability, um, 
I'll read, read out, this is a comment from the land company again. We take a fairly holistic approach to sustainability, so to us it is everything from classic environmental sustainability right through to placemaking and community development, historic interpretation through to affordability, through to even things like the viability of local businesses. We've spread the effort rather than focusing on a couple of things. And at, at the um, beginning, a series of um, sustainability-related aspirations and objectives were identified in this environmental, economic, cultural and social area and indicators and targets um, were developed. And these have been used um, both for guiding decision making around the infrastructure provision um, by the land company, um, stormwater, um, biodiversity, um, community development, etc. But also in the specifications that um, are used that developers tender um, against when they bid in for um, particular land parcels as these are rolled out precinct by precinct. Um, the um, sustainability uh, targets um, are a few notches above usual practice, but they're not um, ambitious targets compared to a number of the European examples um, that we visited. Um, so just to give you an idea of the, the nature of these, uh, these targets, um, just, these are just a couple um, to give you a sense of what, what they're like and, and um, both ones that have been met and haven't been met. Um, so long-term indicators in energy and, and water use. Um, these, these two have been met and these have been um, highlighted in the recent um, sustainability report because the land company puts out an annual sustainability report. Um, they've highlighted these two as, as successful achievements. So the average household grid energy um, consumption, the target is um, 6,500 kilowatt hours uh, and the comment on the... Um, what, were, what the measure was in 2015, 12% lower than the Auckland average and 4% below our target. Um, the it, the um, energy efficiency measures tend to be more passive solar um, and double glazing. Uh, not many of the houses have, have photovoltaics. Um, in terms of uh, water usage, average residential town supply water consumption per person per day, uh, Again, haven't quite met the target, but 33% lower than Auckland's average, 5% above the target. Now, the area that I think everyone acknowledges has been particularly challenging has been the transport, um, uh, meeting transport targets. A lot of work has gone into trying to develop public transport there. There's a ferry that runs from, from the the point to the CBD, bus routes that are quite frequent um, move both to the east and the west of Hobsonville. There's a car, car, city hop carpooling. But the location on the, on the city periphery um, makes it very difficult in terms of sustainability longer term. Um, so even though 40% of workers um, to travel to work by driving themselves was the target, currently it's 79% of driving by car. And there are a number of development indicators um, that, again, are, are, are central to the development. 5% like, um, of premises on the spine road are suitable for conversion to commercial land use, and also accessibility um, measures to make sure all the dwellings are close to um, shops and schools, etc., um, and now this really comes from some of the work that the PhD students have been doing and the um, interviews that they've had with both residents and, and the land company. Um, the uncertainties are absolutely numerous when you're working on a project like this, being political, market, housing preferences, and that at the outset they felt they needed a leap of faith to get it started and have had to be nimble to stay profitable. When you think that they started out just before the global financial crisis, so when construction dropped off and house sales dropped off, and now they're in this real um, surge of demand for houses in Auckland. So being nimble in that regard. It's needed constant adaption for what works and what doesn't, what's commercially viable and what isn't at different stages of the development. You might remember there was a marine precinct planned at one point that was going to provide employment. That didn't work. So now they're looking at how they can um, use that land um, 
land differently. Also, we, it's difficult if you've only got a, a population of a thousand people living there to bring businesses in and then for them to be viable, particularly retail um, businesses. But you know you need them when the, when the population is going to be 10,000. So um, having um, provisions like allowing for flexible spaces that can change from residential to, to retail over time. Um, myths, um, they've been able to crack the myth that Aucklanders won't buy terraced houses or, or apartments. And they also um, have found that it's been really useful to be able to you know, leverage outcomes. So um, a comment from the land company, we don't ever se just sell land with no strings attached. So we're quite controlling in this place-shaping role, and not only the place-shaping role, to get mixed use. Um, the, a, a recent apartment developer was also required to provide for a grocery store, for example. Um, the upfront provision of community infrastructure um, has been really important both for community formation and also for um, selling houses. Um, it's also been, also been important to give residents coming in something of an amenity landscape because they're living in a building site for a very long time with all the dust and noise that that is associated with that. And even community amenities like the local cafe, um, it, 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 they'll go in the day and it's mostly the construction workers. So there's a, a whole transition around um, moving from a construction site to it being a residential community. And also tensions between community as a marketing message to sell houses and an experience of connection amongst the residents. Now, Tiara Moore is my second example, and it's an example, it's much quicker, it's an example of retrofitting streets in an existing neighbourhood to make them easier and safer for walking and cycling. Now, this has taken place within the context of an MB-funded research project in collaboration with Auckland Transport, who are the infrastructure providers. And the goal has been to quantify the safety, health and economic benefits of designing streets in Māngari Central um, with a control sub um, neighbourhood nearby, um, so it's a before and after um, case control um, study. And the overarching goal of the study is to try to bring the um, economic um, costs around um, health improvements into transport decision making. And we've wanted to ensure that the type of intervention that goes in in Māngari is, um, reflects the aspirations of the local people. So there's been a lot of engagement with local politicians and community members. And out of that process has, has come a, a number of design principles many of which echo some of what Philippa was saying before. So the local community were keen for greater priority for pedestrians and cyclists, people feeling safe on routes, reduced traffic speeds, improved people's ability to cross the road safely, prioritised destinations for walking and cycling, um, especially to local schools and the mall, separated bike networks on the major roads, and for the improvements to reflect the local area. So in developing the interventions for these streets, we've taken these design principles on board, as well as data that we've gathered on what are the current local um, transport behaviours of, of people, and also the, the, the sort of best evidence from international um, street design. Um, so a collector road in, in Massey, this is what it looked like uh, above to begin with, and what's, what's going in is better pedestrian, um, better footpaths, two-way separated cycle lanes, and improved crossings. And where the crossings are, um, that's been informed by um, video, da video data that we've analysed on um, where do people naturally cross, so that it, it's in the... Um, natural crossing places, and side roads. These have been um, gateways to the side roads to narrow the entrance and slow traffic down to make the residential um, streets safer. And then a number of the greenways in the area, were for, uh, the locals, local people would experience these as unsettling and unsafe. And so in, in planning um, for this um, urban renewal, uh, the local board has, has funded a fitness circuit that incorporates a lot of the greenways in the central part of the area. And, and we, we've been um, looking at the um, natural surveillance from houses, um, the lighting, and just activating the space by getting more people um, involved. And engagement with um, mana whenua in the area has determined the, um, the colour palette for this fitness trail, the, the local planting that's to go in, the, um, the type of um, wayfinding signage, and also the design and um, uh, carving of po to be placed in um, critical locations. Construction's underway in Mangari. It's maximum disruption at this point in time. But you can see the cycleways going in and the footpaths going in. 
Um, this has also taken a long time. This is 18 months um, slower than envis in originally envisaged. So we're learning that you have to be patient. And Auckland has had its legacy project. It was the Rugby World Cup. And this is the um, Wynyard Quarter before and after. Thank you. <laughs>